Chapter 1, Sundar Singh and what the world says and thinks about him. Who gives himself with his alms feeds three, himself, his hungry neighbor, and me. Sundar D. Sadhu, before entering upon a description of his conversion and baptism, and telling about the marvelous success of his work and his providential escapes from death and enemies, it will be well to explain that Sundar Singh is a Christian sadhu, or itinerating friar. He goes about touring all over India, from Kashmir to Madras, M-A-D-R-A-S, and from Bengal to Gujarat, barefooted, bareheaded, dressed in a thin linen kasak, C-A-S-S-O-C-K, hanging down to his ankles, a small saffron turban on his head, a thin blanket thrown round his shoulders, and a copy of the New Testament in his hand. This is Sundar's dress for all months of the year in all parts of India. The Lenin Kisak is not replaced by a warm one in the winter, nor are the bare feet encased in shoes when going through thorns or thickets. He will not accept any more or better clothes than these, nor ever wear shoes for, quote, even his bleeding feet, he attracts men to Christ, unquote. Quote, the day I became a sadhu, I was wedded to these garments, unquote, said he once, quote, I will never divorce them, unquote. He is tall, spare of body, and subtle of limbs, and he is always wonderfully healthy and cheerful. His face is a true picture of the pure heart that lies within, calm, quiet, and composed. He became a sadhu when he was merely a boy of 16 and now, unlike several others, has been serving the Lord for over 12 years, exactly in the same spirit of earnestness, zeal, humility, and self-denial with which he started. Whenever asked how long he intends going on in this life, he invariably replies, as long as I am in this world. I have bowed my life to him, and his grace abiding, I shall never break this vow. My friend, my brother, and my Lord, what may this service be, nor name, nor form, nor ritual word, but simply following thee? The life of an Indian Sadhu is a life of rigorous and selfless discipline, fraught with dangers and temptations of all kinds. It is a life of daily hardships, self-sacrifice, and humiliation. It is a life in which both body and brain are exposed to excessive wear and terror such as is beyond the very conception of a Westerner. It is not a life which every strong and healthy man can follow, and much less a delicate and daintily nurtured person like Sundar Singh. The Eastern conception of simplicity goes much deeper than the Western. Simplicity in the East means almost self-torture and sacrifice of the least of pleasures and comforts, and complete resignation of oneself to God's care. And this is the life which Sundar is living, a life of absolute reliance on the divine providence. Quote, Who when he provided for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air will certainly feed those whom he has called to serve him. Unquote. Sundar is not a sadhu in the sense that perhaps some Hindus will expect him to be for he conforms himself to any state or condition that he has to put up with. He is a true sadhu in the sense that, whether good or bad, he is prepared to accept anything and everything. A coarse, crusty, C-H-A-P-P-A-T-I, footnote, Indian loaf, and a footnote, is as welcome to him as is an unctuous meal of P-A-L-A-O and P-A-R-A-T-H-A-S. Footnote, two dainty Indian dishes. And a footnote, and an icy cold stone floor makes a luxurious a bed for him as a thickly padded and downy sofa. Quote, everything and anything for his sake. Unquote. It is his principle in life. A Christian turning in aesthetic sounds an incredible to some, as it is a revelation of the power of Christ to others. The term Christian in India is regarded as a synonym for worldliness. 
Hence, if men like Sundar Singh have done nothing else, they have at least proved to the non-Christian world that Christ is not all comfort, and that while he has the power to lift nations to the very zenith of material prosperity, he also has the potency to inspire individuals with a fervent spirit, a perfect self-denial, and self-sacrifice in the service of men and God. The following extract from a letter of a Hindu inquirer proves the truth of our statement. I did not know till I saw Swami Sundar Singh that there are men amongst the Christian who can be called S-A-N-Y-A-S-I-S. Footnote. Sadhus, or those who have renounced the world. End of footnote. It might be here urged that no one, not even an Indian and much less a European, of the bluest blood should launch upon the career of a sadhu at the very first impulse of a moved heart or world-weary soul, nor should the ambition to challenge the gaping admiration of the whole world by some extraordinary action be interpreted as a call from God, as has been done by a few foreigners in the past. Some, as proved by the following quotations, undoubtedly adopted this life in real earnestness, with the sincerest of motives, and with the fullest assurance that in doing so, they were truly obeying God's call. The quotation is from the words of a would-be sadhu. I am considering this as the last and final step in my life, from which, God willing, I shall never turn back. The above letter is perhaps a very true expression of the noble and earnest motives with which our friends started the life. The very fact that the author of these words took up a chaplaincy within a few months of his beginning the life and another of his predecessors got married after a few years proved it was either a woefully distorted conception of God's call or an underestimation of the hardships and trials of such a life that made them vow such rash vows without any forethought about the future. No one then should ever contemplate this life, unless, like Sundar, he can say from his heart, I have vowed my life to him, and his grace abiding, and I shall never break this vow. His amiableness, that Sundar's is a wonderful life ex- exercising a powerful influence on his contemporaries is proved by his character and the amical regard in which he is held by almost every Christian or at least every Indian Christian who has either seen or known him. Christians greet him rapturously wherever he goes and have voluntarily entitled him Swami and Mahatma, two terms of honor and respect which means a partaker of the divine nature. Some ignorant and ill-informed people have objected to these titles, but none else merits these titles better than Sundar does. For in T-H-E-O-L-O-G-I-A and in capital G-E-R-M-A-N-I-C-A, we read, quote, Some may ask, what is to be a partaker of the divine nature, unquote, or a godlike man? Answer, he who is imbued with and illuminated by the eternal or divine light and inflamed or consumed with eternal or divine love. He is a godlike man and a partaker of the divine nature. Moreover, in a man who is made a partaker of the divine nature, there is a thorough and deep humility. And where this is not, the man hath not been made a partaker of the divine nature. And such a man is Sundar without the least tinge of self-consciousness, who does not think himself at all wonderful. What Professor... O-G-I-L-I-B-I-E says of John de B-R-I-T-T-O might well be said of him. In the greater church of all Christ's followers, his eminence as a disciple, intrepid, selfless, and enduring in all great qualities that add to the uh, vigor of the Christian life is assured. He is really one of the greatest missionaries in India in the wider church of Christ. The encolum, E-N-C-O-M-I-U-M, is high, but it is merited. The few utterances of some of his admirers, whose admiration in some cases rushes to the verge of worship, will show the love and admiration that he commands from the Christians of India. In Indian, capital T-A-H-S-I-L-D-A-R, writes, Mahatma Sundar Singh should be called Apostle Paul of this age. 
The other day he stayed here for two days and delivered two lectures, and all the Christians were aroused from their sleep. I can say for myself that the Mahatma was sent for me. I received a letter from my brother that Mahatma will visit B and put up with me. I was amazed with joy. At once went to the station and received my worthy guest and brought him to my poor house. I was impressed much with the simplicity of this real Christian and began to think about my soul. He spent two nights with me and now I can say I am changed. An American missionary once wrote to Sindar, My own dear brother, I do not need to tell you how I long to see you once more before leaving my dear adopted country. I prayed that I might see you and even yet the tears come when I think of the long separation before us. I had so long to learn more from you, from your rich experience of heavenly things. Dear brother, my life has been fuller and richer since you came into it. God sent you to P to open my eyes to new truths and new beauties of holiness. God bless you every moment, and through your sufferings may multiply multitudes of Indians, dear ones, be brought into the heavenly rest you have suffered, little brother, but it took that to bring out the sweetness which is now making fragrance so many lives in the Punja and indeed all over India. A Christian girl once wrote to him, Although I have never seen you, I have heard about you and I have a great love for you and longed to see you. You are my dear, very brother in the Lord and I hope to see you in the next world, if not in this. Another writes, Now my parents and I humbly request you to visit our home. We shall think ourselves blessed by the Lord if you do so. Swami J.I., please do come and visit our home. And although we are not worthy of it, you have a very good chance of preaching gospel here. The above are only a few of the numerous letters and communications in the office possession, which will prove how completely Sundar Singh's simplicity, love, and his wholehearted service to the Lord has captured and enthralled the hearts of all true Christians in India, Indians as well as Europeans. The usefulness of his work. It requires no long-winded descriptions to understand the great usefulness of Sundar's work. None who judge his work with an unbiased eye can deny that his work speaks for itself. The influence of his quiet and yet arrestive life underlies scores of hearts that have been touched and vanquished for the Lord Jesus. The worth of his work could, can be judged from the following witnesses which tell the wonderful work of this simple and devoted missionary. From the Indian Standard, number one, J-A-I-P-U-R. This week we have the pleasure of walking among us that Indian Christian Mahama, Swami Sundar Singh of the Penja. He entertained us with a highly in, in, invigorative spiritual treat. His sermons were at once interesting and edifying. He laid bare the dangerous position of the church which is content with being not far from the kingdom of heaven. The least distance, say of an inch, he said, will keep you keep for you in store as much disappointment and sorrow as that inch thick plaque that stand stood be, between the five foolish virgins and the bridal chamber. The virgins were near enough, but did proximity console them? Far from it, it enhanced their grief and sorrow. If our mental beliefs find not their vent in our actions in daily life, if we believe in the goodness of, quote, love thy neighbor, unquote, and love not, rest assured, though near enough, that fatal plank will debar us from entering in. Quick, get up then, while yet there is time, and strive to cover that least distance and enter in. Otherwise, there is no safety, however near we might be. In another lecture, he demonstrated that the great mission of carrying the message of love was reserved by God for men and men only. Observe that the angels led the seekers after truth to be a Peter or a Philip rather laboriously, but do not say themselves, believe in Christ and be saved. How great is the privilege of man then to be chosen to act in preference to the angels? Do we realize it? Would that we could. Then urged by the power of the Holy Spirit, a power far surpassing any physical force, a power that converted the erstwhile hiding, fearing, silent apostles into brave champions of truth, we could not but proclaim the great truth by word and deed. 
that I was blind and now I see. Number two, capital P-I-P-L-O-D-A, comma, capital K-O-T-A-H. This year, the K-H-A-R-I-F crop is very small, owing to excessive rain, and because of the sodden state of the soil, much of the land could not be prepared and sown. Consequently, where there should have been 100 M-A-U-N-D-S, there are only 12. However, God has been giving us much spiritual blessing. After Swami Sundar Singh came, many eyes were opened. People began to give more heed to spiritual things and repented. The result is God has manifested himself in our midst, and the whole church has been stirred up. Both men and women with one mind and with much joy and prayer are taking part in God's services. They go regularly to the villages nearby and preach. Truly, there is a revival in our midst, and God is day by day manifesting himself and blessing us. The following three letters translated straight from the uh, capital N-U-R, capital A-F-S-H-A-N, the paper in which they originally appeared, while revealing the result of his work, also suggests how very unconscious Sindar is of the great work God is doing through him. It is not only his inspiring and edifying lectures that move and win people's hearts, but it is the deep humility and pure simplicity of the man which makes his words so real and effective. It is rather, as many have said, seem, Christ liveth that hearing him preached. The writers of these three letters are Hindus who soon afterwards became Christians. Number one, a miracle. A few weeks ago, a Christian sadhu by name Sundar Singh came about preaching the gospel in the villages round about N-A-R-K-A-N-D-A, and suffered a great deal of persecution. We were sitting and chatting with the mate, footnote, rather an important person on the hills who arranged mules and coolies for travelers, end of footnote. When a farmer by name N-A-N-D-I came up and said, a very strange thing has happened in our village. One day, while we were reaping the corn in the field, a sadhu came up to us and began to preach religion. We all felt very annoyed at this inferences in our work and showered some curses on him. But little heeding our curses and threats, the man went on with his talk. At this, my brother took up a stone and hit the man in the head. But this good man, unmindful of this insult, closed his eyes and said, O oh God, forgive them. After a while, my brother, who had flung the stone, was suddenly caught with a splitting headache and had to give up reaping. At this, the Siddhartha took the, my brother's seat and started reaping the corn. We all marveled and said, What manner of man is this Sadhu, that instead of abusing and cursing us in return, he prays in our favor? Then we took him to our house, where he told us many nice things. After he had gone, we noticed an amazing thing. The field where this good man had reaped has never yielded so much corn as it has this year. We have gathered two M-A-U-N-D-S above the average this time. Hearing this, one of the crowd who happened to know Sundar Singh forbade us to utter his name, saying that the Sundar Singh was a Christian. But I at once rebuked this fellow and told him that I knew Sundar Singh myself and what a holy man he was. A few days ago, I met a European lady on her way to Simla. I told her about this matter, and she advised me to send an account of this marvelous incident to the capital N-U-R, capital A-F-S-H-A-M, because she said this Sindar is a fruit of the L-A-D-H-I-A-N-A church. Hence, according to her advice, I sent this communication to the editor with many hearty congratulations to the Christian church at Luhene and request the Sindar J-I, an example, Sudar Singh, himself to visit that same village again, so that we may benefit by his holy preaching. We are all ready to listen to your, an example, Sundar's, words of wisdom and desire to benefit by your holy presence in our midst. Signed, J.R. Number two, a real preacher. One morning near R-I-S-H-I, capital K-E-S-H, I was going along the bank of the Ganges to have my morning bath. When seeing a crowd of sadhus in one place, I also hurried to the spot. Here I found a young sadhu, gospel in hand, and preaching to the gathering crowd. 
although he wore a black cassock. But his shining visage interpreted the purity and sanctity of his heart. While some of the crowd looked deeply interested in his talk, many stood scoffing and jeering at him. But his selfless preacher took no notice of this and went on with his message. Presently, one of the crowd took a handful of sand and threw it into the preacher's eyes. This undeserved insult filled me with great anger, and I immediately handed him over to the police. While this true sanctity quietly got up, washed his sand besmeared face and eyes in the river, came back to his former place, and asking his enemy to be released, started preaching again. Seeing this, S I T A capital R A M parenthesis the man who had thrown the sand in parenthesis fell at the Sadhu's feet and wept for forgiveness, saying, I did not know that gems were hidden under that, this cloak. Woe unto me that before I threw sand into your eyes, the devil had thrown sand into my eyes, which blinded me so completely that I could neither see your affectionate heart nor conceive the Lord Jesus who dwelt therein. I had long been in quest of such a guru who could wash away my filth and stuff from my heart and fill it with heavenly bliss. Now I have found him, found him, found him. I was greatly surprised at seeing this stony heart multiplied so quickly by hearing the message of this godly and selfless Sadhu. This is the true disciple of Christ, who sits in the banks of the Ganges and rescues the drowning. Now this Sadhu with his new follower, parenthesis, i.e., capital S-I-T-A, capital R-A-M, Unparenthesized, has gone up towards the hills there to find the lost sheep. They will also go to the great capital M A H A capital R I S H I at capital K A I L A S H. Unfortunately, I was unwell at the time they left. Hands could not accompany them. Dear friends, this is a very extraordinary life for us. A youth bred and brought up in such luxury and comfort denying the best things of the world, is now going about thus serving his Savior and countrymen. Till now, I was under the impression that there are few men of high caste and noble descent among the Christians. Neither is there any such amongst them who could be truly termed a Sanjasi, S-A-N-Y-A-S-I. But since I saw Swami Sundar Singh, I have realized my mistake, and now I know that there are men amongst the Christians like whom none are to be found in other religious sects. If there had been such a man amongst the Hindus or Muslims, we would have been made much of. But unfortunately, the Christians have not yet the power of appreciation. Perhaps this is the result of the new civilization, which is more inclined towards um, footnote um, fashion. But no, fashion, a term used in India for dainty ways of dressing and grand ways of living. End of footnote. I advise, nay implore, my Hindu and Muslim friends to put aside the spirit of rivalry and bigotry and to benefit by his friendship, because as every sect can claim God as its own. In the same way, S-W-A-M-I-J-I, too, belongs to no special sect, but has been sent by God that everyone may benefit by his wonderful life. Swami Sundar Singh is a very simple and quiet man, and it is only when you talk to him that you realize the presence of those jewels that are hidden in him. This is the result of his constant and close communion with the Lord Jesus. I have been studying the gospel for several years together, but certain doubts withheld me from openly confessing Christ's name. Now I praise God that he sent capital M-A-H-A-T-A-M-A-J-I to me, whose fellowship drove away all my doubts just as the sun, S-U-M, does the darkness. This is because the sun of righteousness dwelleth in his heart. I spent several years at the feet of the uh, Pundes, that's P-U-N-D-I-T-S, footnote, religious authorities, end of footnote, studying the capital S-H-A-S-T-R-A-S footnote, the Hindu scriptures, end of footnote, but none gave me the real peace, which I have found at last in the Lord Jesus. Now, in return for this great blessing, I want to dedicate my whole life to his service. I am waiting for the 
Swamiji, an example, Sundar Singh, to return from the hills and baptize me with his own blessed hands. In the end, I request all the readers of the NUR, capital A-F-S-H-A-N, to remember me in their prayers that being filled with the Holy Spirit, I too, like Swami Sundar Singh, may become a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, the priceless gem of the Punjab, P-U-N-J-A-B. I am employed in the forest department. Coming down the mountain one day, I saw the Sandhu coming up the ascent. He had a few books in his hands and a blanket on his shoulder. He strove along in the midday sun, the perspiration running like water down his face. At first, I thought to join with him and have a little conversation, but then I said to myself, I will see what we will do and where we will go. A little later, he entered a village, and after wiping his face, he sat down upon a log and began to sing. When we were drowning in sin, Christ from heaven came to save us, etc. I, an enthusiastic, capital A-R-Y-A, became furiously angry, and when he began to preach, I could scarcely restrain myself. At the same time, a man sprang forward from out of the crowd and with a blow knocked the holy man from the seat headlong upon his face, hurting his hand badly and cutting his cheek. That brave man rose up and bound his hand with his turban and did not say a word. With the blood flowing down his face and tears mingling with the bloody stream, he began to sing a song of joy and praise to God and then prayed God's blessing upon us. These tears of the holy man dropped like pearls upon the ground. One day they will come forth from the ground as real pearls. What, is it possible that the blood and tears of such a spiritual person should be fruitless? Never. I, who was once a solid member of the capital A-R-Y-A, capital S-A-M-A-J, though I have not yet been baptized, yet I have been drawn out of the well of contempt and brought to the fountain of life. We may know, not know where Swami Maharaj Sandra Singh may be at this time, but that Kirpa, K-I-R-P-A, Ram, who threw your honor down, is now in search of you and wants to know where his guru, teacher, has gone. He has received baptism at the hand of the Reverend Mr. Jones. Although he greatly desired to be baptized with that wounded hand, but could not because Sunda Sadhusa Dash Singh does not baptize but preaches the gospel only. Yet he may know that by his means hundreds of souls are brought to Christ, of whom he has no personal knowledge. O oh, Christian, what visionary Christ are you following? This is the following of the living Christ. O oh, Hindu sadhus who lie about the palaces of the rich merchants, indulging yourself with sweet meats in your idleness, here is a real sadhu who, sacrificing his life, goes about seeking for lost sheep in the dens and caves of these mountains. Just think that at the age of 26 years, this exalted servant service has never been rendered for worldly game. O oh, Christians, O oh, Hindus and Muslims, how is your opportunity to scour benefit from companionship with this holy man? Such priceless gems do not continue for long in this world. But alas, we generally get away just when such gems go from us. During their lifetime, we oppose them with lengthy discourses and the acceptance of truth is in such low state that if one were to rise from the dead and come to his brother, he would not believe. Luke 16.30 I pray God to save me from this deadly condition and give me the fellowship of such a holy teacher. In conclusion, I would beseech all readers of the capital N-U-R, capital A-F-S-H-A-N, to pray for me that I may be able to confess openly my faith in the Lord Christ. Signed, an inquirer. It is a fact to be regretted that while so many have the eyes to see and appreciate this wonderful work, there are some who deliberately refuse to realize the greatness of Sunder's work and personality. This is that class of worldly wise people whom Sunder's simple and selfless life menaces with a close criticism of their own so-called, quote, simple, unquote, lives. These people eye Sunder in such a rage at the superior results of his work that they would spurn out venom at him from sheer envy 
especially when they feel that their own work is put into shade before that of the young sadhu of 28. But fortunately for the Christian church in India, such unworthy exceptions are only very rare and they seldom have the courage to speak out their minds and whenever they do, they do so only to reveal P-U-S-I-L-L-A-N-I-M-I-T-Y of their own minds and their unworthiness even to be called Christians. Sundar's Passion for the Cross Sundar Singh has a passion for the cross of Christ. He comes from a well-to-do Sikh, S-I-K-H, family in the Punjab, and but for his being a Christian and a Sadhu, he would have inherited his thousands. The following two letters will show what he has given up, with what motives and in what spirit. The first one is from his father, Alurin Sindur, away from his life of a Christian. Sadhu and the second one is Sandhu's reply to the above. Number one. The Father's letter, O oh dear, my dear son, the light of my eyes, the comfort of my heart, may you live long. We are all quite well here and hope the same for you. I do not now wait to ask you what you think, but I order you to get married immediately. Can you not serve your Guru Christ in a married state? Now, make haste and don't go on disappointing us. Does the Christian religion teach disobedience to parents? I do not know what I may pass away, but I do know that if you do not get married now, you never will after my death. You have gone mad. Just think for a moment, who will take care of so much property, or do you want to blot out the family name? If you get engaged today, I will bequeath to you the whole sum of money now in the three banks, the interest of which amounts to three to four hundred rupees a month. Otherwise, you will lose what I have already reserved for you. It will be for your welfare if you take my advice and come home at once. Then everything will be properly settled. I am also a little indisposed. If you do not listen to my advice, I shall stop helping you from next month. I found out later that you gave away the RS750 to be the Christian. What a fool you are. You do neither feed nor address yourself properly, but give away what you have to other people. Why reply your loving father? Signed, S.S. Number two, Sunder's reply. My dear and respected father, thank you very much for your kind letter, read my engagement and marriage. I am always at your service and reckon it an honor to obey you and do your will. But I regret to say that I cannot and will not get married. You are my earthly father, but besides you I have another father which is in heaven who is to be obeyed and served above everyone else. My father has called me to serve him as a F-A-K-I-R, and I must obey this call. If I get married, I shall not be able to do my duty, and the truth is that I have no great desire for money. As for your threats of disinheriting me, all I can say is that I was not hoping for any property or money when I became a Christian. I regarded it a favor when at my baptism you left me alone and when after some time you again started helping me, I was thankful. Now if you leave me again, I will not gainsay you, but will only thank you for what you do. You are wise and experienced and can do what you like. As for me, having once put my hand to the plow, I must not look back. Your obedient servant, Sundar Singh. That is a real joy to him to suffer for the Master's sake is provided by the following testimony of one of his co-workers in the earlier part of his friar's life. His work has been far better than my own, and although he is scarcely more than a boy, he has suffered hunger, cold, sickness, and even imprisonment for his master. Before leaving him, I will tell of one thing which illustrates his saintly spirit and his fitness for the friar's life. We had been some hundreds of miles back into the interior, and had been forced to pass through some very unhealthy country. Sundar Singh was attacked by fever day after day, and also by acute indigestion. At length one night, as we were tr trudging along, he became so bad that he could no longer walk, and fell almost fainting to the road. Our way ran to the mountains, and there was a bank by the side of it. To this I dragged him, and set him against it in such a way that his head might be higher than his feet. 
He was trembling with the, the, the chill which precedes the fever, and his face was drawn with pain caused by his stomach trouble. I was anxious because we were alone and on foot, and the weather was very cold. Bending close to his ear, I asked him how he was feeling. I knew he would never complain, but I was unprepared for the answer which I received. He opened his eyes and smiled absently. Then, in a voice almost too low to be heard, said, I am very happy. How sweet it is to suffer for his name. This spirit is the keynote of his life and dominating influence in all he does. And who can tell all the adversaries Sundar has suffered for his master's sake? The reader will be able to form some idea of it by reading the succeeding chapters. Some account of his labors for the Lord is best given in its original form, the unaffected simplicity of which reveals the earnest and sincerity of the man. Writing some three years ago, he says, I thank God that he has chosen unworthy me in the days of my youth, that I may spend the days of my strength in his service. Even before baptism, my prayer to God was that he would show me his ways, and so he who is the way, the truth, and the life did show himself to me, and called me to serve him as a sadhu and to preach his holy name. Now, although I have suffered hunger, thirst, cold, heat, imprisonment, malediction, bodily infirmities, persecution, and innumerable other evils, yet I thank and bless his holy name, that through his grace my heart is ever full of joy, and from my ten years' experience, I can unhesitantly say that the cross bears those who bear the cross. I take across thy shoulder from my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know, nor gain, nor loss. My sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. And chapter one have been read by Peter John Parisi.